In a recent Facebook Live, my friends were discussing longevity in pets, and they went around and interviewed the owners of the world's oldest living dogs. And the oldest was 30 years old. And they were looking for commonalities, like is it the breed of dog that lives longer than others? Is it the kind of food that they feed? Uh, and none of that was true. It was a mind blow to discover the one thing that they found in common. Wait a minute, why don't I see if I can just get Rodney on FaceTime and maybe he could tell us himself. Okay, let's, uh, let's see. Mr. Rodney. There he is! What's happening? Mr. Rodney Habib, um, I was just doing a, a little a video and talking about a piece you did on longevity. And when you went and interviewed the owners of those like ultra long living dogs. Yes. And what was the commonality? I, I didn't, it wasn't a spoiler alert. I said, I'm going to let you tell what the commonality is and biophysically why, why, why that was the case. Well, one, one of the, first of all, hello, Susan, and you <laughs> look awesome today. I just want to say that it's Canadians. That's the first thing that we have to talk about. Whoa, whoa. But yes, you know, there's a huge, there's many correlations when it comes to longevity. It's kind of being broken down into one third, one third, one third sections as we've spoken about, where you've got genetics and you've got, of course, nutrition and environment. And within environment, one of those big, big, big factors is exercise. That is massive. In fact, when we were looking up all of what, say even looking up, when we were actually traveling to the areas to sit down and interview these people with these longest lived pets, for instance, Maggie, the 31 year old Kelpie with Brian McLaren, one of the first things that he brought to light was the fact that this dog was moving constantly. And by moving constantly, we're not just talking about like walking around the backyard right. or, or opening that door and the dog, maybe a 20 minute walk around the neighborhood. This dog would follow Brian McLaren from one end of his dairy farm to the other end while he was on his tractor, the dog would walk behind him. And when I asked Brian McLaren, how far is that distance from like one end to the other? 10 kilometers, Susan, wow. from one end of the farm to the other. That dog had to still get back 20 kilometers a day that dog was getting of exercise. And these commonalities between Maggie and these long-lived pets were Fast. For instance, the 25-year-old vegan dog that a lot of people are still in awe about, Bramble from the United Kingdom. The mother in her book and also in an interview when we spoke with her said, Anne Heritage, had said that Bramble, up to the age of 25 years old, was getting minimum of two hours of exercise every day. But as Bramble started to get sort of creaky and started to age, two hours of swimming wow. at least every single day and so we were starting to find all of these commonalities that these animals were getting a minimum of two hours of exercise on a daily basis and so what was it metabolically that was happening that was extending life and you and i spoke about this before when we sat down with dr stephen gundry the best-selling right. author for the plant-based the paradox, plant paradox yep. diet that he put together dr gundry we used to say in the olden days cardiologists used to tell you that you only had so many heartbeats before you died but today, the new, the new stream of thinking is the, that we only have so many calories that we can use until we die. And that's why that theory, those thin, tiny, frail people in China that can live to be like 120 versus people that are a little bit heavier set in North America that are dying around 70 years old. So bringing that theory back to exercise, as you're constantly moving, you are, preserve, you are burning those calories rather than your body using them up. Mm. And so if you only have, let's say, hypothetically, a million calories you can use up in your lifetime, by constantly moving around, exercising, moving your body, being physically active, you're burning those calories off, negating them, neutralizing them, so you can carry on to the next day and living an extra day longer. So exercise is huge when it comes to longevity. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And it's average of two hours we're talking, right, Rodney? An average of two hours, these dogs were like, on the, they were on the constant grind, so moving around. One good example was Tigger, the 22-year-old pit bull from Waco, Texas. What made this dog so phenomenal was this dog was visiting hospitals, was moving around constantly all day, was going to uh, daycares, was, was, they were putting this dog with a, a, a lot of like sort of fearful, anxious dogs because this dog was so calm that this dog was constantly moving. So it's not like the dog has to be in the gym doing push-ups every single day for two hours, but constantly on the move, constantly burning calories and by, and 
and breathing, elevating that heartbeat. So it's not just, hey, this I opened up the back door and that dog's been in the backyard for nine hours. No, that it's a minimum duration of at least two hours of some good movement and brief bursts of heart thumping exercise, according to research, also has a advantageous. They call it the good stress on the body. We are going to the whiteboard and I'm gonna share with them 15 ways they can get that exercise in their dog. Thanks for your help, bud. All right, perfect, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Two hours of exercise is a bit of a mind blow. Let me share with you how it's gonna work for you and your dog. Now, you might be thinking, oh, okay, Susan, uh, how am I gonna get my dog two hours of exercise a day? I've got all sorts of stuff I gotta get done in a day. Well, you may or may not be able to get do um, th those two hours of exercise on, uh, in. Now, remember, this is on average, so you might get more on the weekend and less during the week when you're working, but I thought I would share the top 15 ways that people may or may not want to accumulate exercise for their pet. If you're sitting there watching, well, I just turn my dog out in the backyard and that's how he gets his exercise. Most dogs are gonna walk around and do some sniffing, um, but they're really not going to do a ton of exercise in your backyard. So I wouldn't even count that on the counter of how much exercise your dog gets in a day. All right, so here are some of the things that I recommend. My favorites. Um, are hiking and swimming. So hiking ideally would be off leash, but if you're going for a long hike and, and your dog has to be on, on leash, I would recommend using a harness, one that doesn't constrict with the dog's shoulder. So you don't want the ones that come across the chest. You want the ones that are cut out so the dog gets free motion with their shoulder. So ideally when you're hiking, it's various terrain. So there might be some hills that you have to walk up. You know, the kind of hiking that you probably don't want to do, but it's good for all of us guys. Um, you might be hiking along the beach. The sand is good for your dogs. Walking through some low, maybe up to their ankle height of water, that's great for your dog, right? So that could be something that you can include ideally daily. It might only be 15 minutes and then longer on weekends. Swimming, a couple of things that you need to be uh, concerned with. Number one, blue-green algae toxicity is a huge problem with dogs swimming in some water. So you need to be really, really careful. Um, if you're swimming in, in water, any water is suspect to blue-green algae toxicity. So make sure that um, the water you're going in, you, um, you've, you've got the clear that it is okay for your, for your pet. And it, certainly you can test for that. Um, the other thing to worry about is swimming. A lot of dogs like to bite at the water when they're swimming, or if you're throwing a toy saying, Susan said I gotta get two hours in, so I'm gonna do 30 minutes of retrieving. Your dog might be drinking a lot of water with that. Water toxicity just from the dog swimming is a dangerous thing. So be careful if your dog drinks a lot of water when they're swimming. Don't let them swim for long periods of time. If you have a dog that when they're done swimming, they pee and pee and pee, that is a danger. That's a red flag that you need to be aware of, okay? But swimming is a great activity. My dog swim. Uh, every single week of their life because I have a pool that, that, that we can use in the winter. And there, for a lot of you, there are facilities, rehab facilities, that, uh, or swimming facilities that you can go to and they will do the sw swim your dog for you. So that look into your local area, ask around where I, can I swim my dogs? Because um, there will be places nearby. A lot of these places also have underwater treadmills, which are so good. They're actually, that's actually better for your dog than swimming because it, when it's underwater, um, depending on the height of that your dog's swimming, it takes some of the pressure off the joints. Super good thing if you can find somebody with an underwater treadmill, treadmill nearby. Okay, these next activities are things you can do in your home. So you really don't even need, maybe it's a rainy day or maybe it's a winter day. Number one, stair work. Now there's a couple things you can do here. Getting your dog on a leash and harness or, um, and just getting some really good treats and get your dog to walk beside you up and down the stairs. Go ahead and try it today. It's super hard. Your dogs don't want to walk up and down stairs. They want to gallop upstairs because it's a lot easier on them, but it's much better exercise if you get them to walk. Just start, if you have a flight with just one or two or three stairs, start easy getting them to walk beside, give them cookies. Um, and you could also um, turn that into a game with a remote feeder. Treadmill you can do indoors. I strongly recommend you get a 
a treadmill made just for dogs. Uh, if you have a little chihuahua or something smaller, then you know that may not be a big problem. But for my border collies, as soon as you start opening up that stride, if you put them on a human treadmill, they're going to artificially have to shorten their stride, which isn't good for them. So you want a treadmill made specifically for um, for dogs. They are the the tread on them actually is a much much longer. So um, I I I have actually a couple of those treadmills that I use. And personally, I don't like to do anything other than a walk or a trot and do a lot of walking, a little bit of trotting, a lot of walking, a little bit of trotting, okay? So um, dog tread is the treadmill I've always used, really like it, but there's many out there for you to choose from. Okay, nose work. Hiding cookies under cushions where the dog has to just search around. You can grow that or do formal nose work. It actually is a sport where the dog use, uh, uses their nose to find scents like wintergreen or whatever it is that you you um, you train them to. Super easy. There's a lot of schools uh, springing up all over the area. Jane Book has got a great online course that teaches you how, uh, your dog how to use their nose. Fitness stations. This could be as simple as getting your dog to back up or sit down stand. Just getting them to use their body. Love Fit Paws equipment for this. They have Fit Bones. They have Fit Donuts. But you could keep it super simple. Um, get your cushions off the couch and have your dog walk across the cushions or have them sit stand. Obviously, the Fit Paws equipment is made specifically for dogs, so I like to use the Fit Paws for the fitness stations. And there's tons of people that are teaching routines that you can get from puppy on all the way up to geriatrics to, to use fitness work. Okay, inside and maybe going a little bit outside, but the commonality of these next ones are games that build an interaction between you and your dog. So all of our recaller games, starting with uh, restraint recallers where the dog learns to chase you. The dog is running, it's great exercise for the dog, but we have 40, 41 now recaller games that, that um, most of them involve movement for the dog. Simple retrieve. So you can retrieve, get your dog to retrieve um, something by hand, which a flying disc, Again, a little caveat, they could be very dangerous. A lot of ACLs are blown by dogs jumping up for a flying disc. I don't recommend things like, if you're using something that flies, I like the dog to be able to run under it and grab it while it's still in the air. So if you're using a ball, bounce the ball in a way that the dog runs under it and they grab it. Because once it's on the ground, dogs tend to dive on them and jam their bottom jaw into the ground and they cause all sorts of neck problems. So be sure that if you're using a retrieve, um, you're getting it, you're doing something that the dog can catch it in the air. Now, to avoid that, you can go to something that you kick, like a, like a big ball, a soccer ball, or a dog ball, made, balls specifically made for dogs, where you just kick it, the dog chases it, grabs it, brings it back. So, um, retrieve doesn't have to be something right to your hand, it can be something that you kick. Cycling with your dog. Now, if you're getting on a bicycle with your dog, well, that would be a sight, wouldn't it? Never mind. If you are going to take your dog out for a bike ride, make sure it's super short to begin with and build up on any of these activities. If your dog's kept, had a bit of a sedentary life and has got that, you know, middle inner tire right now, we've got to get them down slowly, cycling a little bit at a time. And please, please, please do not be one of those people trying to cycle with your dog holding a leash on the handlebars. Springer is a great uh, adaptation that you can just put on your bike and it, it, if the dog gets spooked or goes sideways, then the Springer absorbs that pull and doesn't pull you over. Of course, the Springer goes on the side away from the traffic, but that's a great way to exercise your dog on a safe trail that's a way, ideally not on concrete, a nice, we, around us we have a rail trail, which is beautiful, it's stone, we can take our dogs uh, on a bike or, or a walk. Um, dog sports, training for things like agility or fly ball or lure coursing, those are all great things. Actually, there's a little lure coursing machine they make for little dogs if you want your little dog chasing something around your house. Another way to get them exercise. Um, in the winter, you can do things like snowshoeing is what, one of my favorites. You can do ski joining with your dog or even cross-country skiing, but be careful of the little poles. You don't want any poles um, injuring your dogs. Okay, some other exercises. Taking your dog to a dog park or daycare. I'm putting a little asterisk beside these two because they can be 
great and they can be not so great. A lot of dogs have terrible experiences, but I've seen dog parks where, there's one near me where a group of 10 or 11 people have been getting together every night for the last six years at the same dog park. And these dogs are all breeds that you wouldn't expect that would get along. Airedales and Chow Chows and um, you know all uh, ter little terriers, all kinds of them that just, they just get along and they chase each other around. They have a great old time. Um, daycare is another, pick your daycare carefully. Some of them have great structured exercise programs, and a lot of them, if you ask to do something specifically one-on-one -on -one with their do your dog, they'll do it. And finally, exercising your dog through technology. And that's what I referred to earlier, using remote feeders in a way that you set up an exercise um, uh, exercise area for your dog that your dog can do while you are kicking back and relaxing in a reclining chair. I'd love to hear what your favorite way it is that you exercise your dog or cat. Please leave me a comment below. That's it for today.